Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, beginning from verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, <coughs> the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look. Here is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter and that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement and seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord. That's yes. to God. To God. God, we come before you once again in this mystery of resurrection, which catches, which caught the people then by surprise, catches us by surprise, oh God. And I pray this morning that we will get a glimpse of you. Thank you again. So we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Maybe I've said this before, but anyway, it's good to hear it one more time. <clears throat> uh, 2016, um, I had a, a lunch date with my wife uh, in this country. Uh, in this country, you, you have your dates and then you get married. We had it the other way around. We got married and then we went on dates. Uh, we thought it was lovely to do it. So we, we decided to go uh, one day for our lunch and um, I called her up and she said, listen, I am coming that side, can I have lunch with you? So she said, of course. And so we met, we went to a restaurant. And before that, uh, at the end of uh, 2015, that was in uh, December of 2015, I had applied for my PhD program at Princeton. And I was, uh, any time they said uh, you would receive a letter from us uh, telling whether you got like 2005. 2005. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, lovely folks. I am I am just so honored this morning. I am super honored because you know I tell my students the greatest gift that the congregation can give the preacher is to nod when you preach. Here I'm being corrected when I <laughs> uh, man, I cannot get a better congregation than this. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. So 2000, 2005 had I, I had applied for my uh, PhD program and they said to me uh, anytime you would receive a letter from us uh, saying that whether you got accepted or not. And I didn't even strike. Um, so I went home and I, because uh, I, I didn't realize that that day was the, the ultimate day that they would send my letter to me. And so I had uh, sat down on my computer just casually. I didn't even realize. I just casually went into my email and I saw this email and it said, uh, sent an email from the seminary and I looked at it and I clicked it and it opened and it said, congratulations. What? He said, congratulations, you've been accepted in the PhD program. And I said to myself, what? And I said, really? And so what I did was I just forwarded that email to my wife. And so she was in her cubicle working and the, the email appeared on her screen. And so she looks at this email and she said, what? And then people on the uh, nearby cubicle, they said, hey, they call her Esther, by the way. Even though you call her Sumi, they call her Esther. I'm not I'm married to the one person. <laughs> <laughs> and they looked at her and said, Esther, uh, are you okay? 
She said, yeah, 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 no, I'm okay. It's just that uh, my, my husband sent me an email and it said that he's been accepted into the PhD program. I said, oh, they said, oh, that's exciting. And I said to myself, oh, that's exciting to me too. But then, if you know me a little bit more, you would, uh, you would see where I'm coming from this one. Because when I got that letter, I was scared. But at the same time, I was excited. I was really excited because I got accepted to one of the premier seminaries in the country. To do a PhD program, you get, there are only like, in my time, there are only like 15 of us got picked. And to be in a 15 after about 600, 700 people applying for that position, I was like super excited. But again, if you know me a little bit, I was fearful. Because you know, I am not this guy who is brilliant in writing. I am not this guy who can read a book and tell it exactly how it is. I am not. And so when I, when I saw that email and there was this excitement, and there was this fear. And you might ask me, how does that work? How does that work? How does the excitement and fear work? It works, folks. It works you in, me, in your life and in my life too. There is something that happens and becomes impossible in our lives. Both of those things happen so beautifully. We get excited, but we also so fearful. Let me go back to the Christmas story because at the end of December 2015, the uh, uh, end of December, Christmas, we celebrate Christmas. If you know how Christmas works, uh, 2000 years uh, before Christmas. <coughs> 2000 years uh, before Christmas, uh, there was this prophet named Isaiah. And that Isaiah, uh, God speaks through Isaiah and it says, A virgin shall have birth, will have a child and will give birth to a child. 2000 years ago. And so from that time on, every virgin, every teenager in Palestine would just wait for this God to come into their lives. Right? And so after 2000 years, God sends an angel and the angel comes to Mary and the angel says to Mary, Hey, listen, you who are highly favored, God has picked you to bear his son. And you know what? Yeah, the angel said that thing and the angel thought uh, Mary would be super excited. That's not what it says. You know what it says? The scripture says, what? How can this be possible? How can this happen? And you know, but then she also realizes, because it was the dream of every teenager, every virgin teenager in Palestine was, man, if God can come through me. Make any sense? There was this absolute excitement for Mary, but then she realizes if she goes out and tells her parents that she's having a baby without any physical union with Joseph, guess what? She can be stoned to death. You are in trouble. Is it right? You are in trouble. So what it says, the scripture says she was excited, but there was fear. Now you might ask me how that works. It works. Like the way it worked for me, it worked for Mary. Why do I say that? Because in today's story, that's exactly what happens. And I'll come back to you on that. Well, in today's story, it's a fascinating story. It says, uh, Mark, the Gospel writer Mark says, on that third day, it was Sabbath was over, and on the third day, they came to the tomb very early in the morning. Now, Mark is always like that. He'll say, always say, very early, while it was still dark. Yeah, we all know. Right? But that's what he says. Mark says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene and Mary and mother of Salome came to the tomb. And I looked at myself and says, how did they know which tomb to go to? Does it make sense? Today, if you go to a grave, you have those memorials which will say, hey, this name. And I was wondering, hey, did that, did that tomb have a name that said Jesus Christ? But then I went back and I looked at chapter 15 of Mark and in the 15 of Mark, you know what it says? It says, when they laid him in a tomb, guess what? The women saw. If you are not familiar with the Easter story, Easter story, how that happened, very simple. Jesus was born and for 30 years he was just an ordinary guy just roaming around and for the last three years he did some amazing things. 
he just healed people he made great sermons he kind of did great things people loved him people really loved him when he said all of those things and he said blessed are the poor they said oh yeah you are with you but then when he said give away everything i said oh, we have to kill him and so what happened is finally they decided hey this guy is a is a threat to my living let's get him the only way to get him that's what they said right it's better for one man to die than for the whole nation to be in trouble so they said let's get him on the cross they put him on the cross that's it is that right they put him on the cross and after after he suffers on the cross they check him out and they tap his bones to see whether he is really dead and they finally said he's dead let's get him down so it's not resuscitation Resurrection is not resuscitation. It's not like Jesus was fainting and they brought him down at three days. They put some water. He got up. No, no, no. That's not what happened. He dead, total dead. Breaks him down and puts him in the tomb. Is that right? That's what it says. So when they were putting him in the tomb, the three women saw him. So that's it. Right. Next day morning, when they went to the tomb, they exactly knew where the tomb was. No name was needed. Is that right? So they go to the tomb and they. they come there and they are asking this question who will roll away the stone i always tell this i am not an english teacher but i like a little bit of english here and there you know it says they had been saying it's the past perfect continuous which means on the night when they saw on friday night when they went to the tomb and when they saw that big stone that they rolled away and kept over the entrance they went home and they said who will roll away the stone for me who will roll away the stone for me they would ask their husband who will roll away the stone for me that's what it says you know when you and i get obsessed about something in our lives we talk about it all the time isn't it how is this going to happen who will do this for me will god really come through for me That's what they were saying. It's just not they said who will roll away the stone and they forget and then went into the kitchen. No, no, no. When they were working in the kitchen, they said who will roll away the stone. They came back who will roll away the stone. That's what it says. Who will roll away the stone? So they're coming with all of these questions and they come to the tomb. They look up. The stone is rolled. Voila! Great news. But then they walk to the tomb. Problem. Jesus is not there. Every other gospel writer, at least it says Jesus appeared here and there. In Mark, it says no, Jesus doesn't appear. There is no Jesus. There was a young man sitting in the tomb, and he says, "Hey, listen. What you need to do is Jesus already risen. Look at the place. This is where he should have been here. No, he's not here. Now go and tell the disciples. That's what it says. Is that right? Go and tell the disciples. And it says, now what it says? It says he's going ahead of you to Galilee." And I'm asking this question: Why Galilee? Why not somebody else? Why not Jerusalem? Why Galilee? Because if you see, most of the disciples that Jesus picked were from Galilee. And you know what it says? It's not like Jesus says, and not like the guy says, "You go, Jesus will follow you." No, no, no. Even before you reach Galilee, Jesus will be there. Now what is what Mark is trying to tell you and me who are 2000 years after resurrection is trying to tell me after you have worshiped here this morning you will go back to your work you will go back to your school you will do the same things the mundane activities of life guess what Jesus will not follow you will be there good news isn't it must you must be wondering did god really tell me did god really do this will god be there for me Hey, he will be there. He will be there in Galilee even before you reach your Galilee. So now, when you leave this place, right? When you are driving and you are home, Jesus is there already. That's the power of resurrection, isn't it? The power of resurrection is you cannot contain this Jesus in one place. Jesus is on the loose. Yeah, you cannot tie him down. He will be there when you go home. He will be there tomorrow morning when you are at work. He will be there at school. You can trust this guy. You know why? Because look at the next one. You know what it says? He will be there in Galilee. There you will see him. What does it say? You can read it for me. Just as he told you, isn't it? On Palm Sunday, 
before he goes into the Jerusalem, he sends two people and he says, go into the city and you will find a donkey there, right? And they go, and you know what that says? Just as he told them, they found the donkey. Now, if you don't believe that, on Monday, Thursday night, they want to celebrate Passover and he tells the disciples, go to this place, you will see a man carrying a jar and you just follow him, they will have the place prepared. And he says, and the two disciples went there, you know what it says? Just as he told them. You know why Jesus will be there for our galleries? Why? Just as he told you. You and I don't worship a God who just says one thing and does something. You and I worship a God who keeps his promise. If he says to you, I'll be there, you'll be there. You can take him for granted. He'll be there. Only Mark kind of awkwardly finishes the gospel story. You know what it says? Look at verse 8 and it says, So they went out and fled from the two. Now this is what I said to you. Remember, there are two things. What does it say? Terror and amazement. You might ask me, how does that work? It works. Terror is because, how will I go and say that my Jesus, who you kill, is now on the loose? Terror, I'm afraid. But then it's the greatest news, isn't it? It's the most amazing news. You're amazed. That's what it says. Terror and amazement. Like the way I was afraid and I was excited. Like Mary, afraid and excited. The women, terror and amazement. And seized them. And you know what? If I finally look at the last one. It says, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Mark finishes the story. And I said to myself, how awkwardly you can finish. It's like Ma had a piece of paper and writing it and then suddenly he realizes he has run out of ink. There's nothing more to write. Yeah. And he just leaves the pen. And it says, and they were afraid. And they walked away. I said to myself, what kind of a message? This actually is the most amazing news, isn't it? All of you are sitting down here it's because you have been compelled by instruction. You didn't come here just to, if it's your tradition, maybe that's okay. But you came here because you chose to be here on church on Sunday morning. Yeah, you chose to be here. You've come here, this is the greatest news, but then the women said nothing about it. I can, I'm, tried, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to try and explain resurrection to you. Because it will just fall flat. It really will. But let me offer this to you. This might be the most simplest idea that I can offer. But let me offer this to you. I was a little early for worship practice yesterday. And when I came to this place, the parchment on this one was this. This was what we did for Good Friday. Is that right? And then I realized, Good Friday is over. I need to change all of these altar plots. And so I did it this way. Here you go. Easter. God flips things from Good Friday to Easter. If you want to know what resurrection is all about, what happened on Good Friday gets flipped that way gets flipped and you and I have the assurance of new life. Isn't that beautiful? But you know, it's not as easy as you think. It's not like if you go from now when, I, when you go from this place, it's not like you'll be running around on the streets of uh, Springfield and you'll stop everybody and say, hey, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen. I don't think you will do it. I don't think even God expects you to do that. Because resurrection is hard to understand. If there is a mix of doubt and faith in you this morning, you are in good hands. You really are in excellent hands. Because resurrection is not like, I've got it. Yeah. 
resurrection kind of is a mystery that you have to live into it. That's part of the reason why I said, if I try to explain resurrection to you, it will fall flat. But if you, if you begin to live into resurrection, then it will make sense to you. Can I hear amen? amen? So if you have doubts, go and tell God. God, it's just impossible for me to believe that you came to life. Go and tell God. You say to God, God, I know death is final, but resurrection I cannot understand. Go tell it to God. Because you know what? He's heard that before. He's heard that before. And he'll say to you, hey, listen, I've heard it because death told me. Because death told me I am the end. He says, no, you will never be. So folks, when you go from this place, the God whom we put in the tomb on Friday is alive and is loose. Is here, will be there, will be there when you get home, when you are at work. Everywhere you go, God is there. So I'm going to pray with you. Again, as I said, if you have this little bit of a doubt in you and say to you, God, I just cannot uh, figure this out. This is too much for me. Resurrection is too big for me. Resurrection is super hard for me. But Lord, I, 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 I am filled with terror and amazement. God says to you, good. We are on the right track. I'll take it. I'll take whatever you offer, God says to you. So I'm just going to pause for a minute and then you say to God, whatever you want to say in the quietness of your heart. You say to God, God, I, uh, I have a hard time believing. Just leave me alone. God says, that's okay. I'll bring you to that place. Because I think for the women, they came to that place when they began, when that experience, when the resurrection began to make sense in their life. And then they began to say, because if they had not told, guess what, you and I will not be on the pews this morning. Because there's something that happened to that woman. They went and they told. Today, fear and trembling is catching you. That's okay. God will come with you. Will turn your more mourning into dancing. Yeah, will turn your fear into joy. Will turn your doubts into amazement. Believe in this God. Otherwise, we are just wasting time this morning. Just believe. Because this, the God that you and I believe will turn our terrors will turn our tears into joy. That's a promise he told us and he will keep it. To that God we commit to. If you said that prayer, if you said that in the deepest of your heart, the God that you and I worship takes you seriously, you and me seriously. To that God we commit to. Go in that confidence. God will meet you. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you.